Jiro here for Ember Games with a review of Super Bomberman R, exclusively on Nintendo Switch. It's been at least since the Nintendo 64 days since I played a new Bomberman, but my personal fondness for Bomberman comes from the Super Nintendo days, complete with multi-tap. One of the few games I've probably spent more time on the multiplayer component than the campaign, I'm talking probably hundreds of hours spent at the neighbor's house growing up. For those of you not familiar with the series, the concept is fairly simple. You move your colored robot around and through a grid placing bombs that will explode moments later and obliterate things in their path. At a basic level, you can't walk through a bomb once you've placed it, and it will destroy the destructible pieces of environment, be they walls or, in this game, floors as well. You can obtain power-ups that allow you to lay more bombs at a time, flames to increase the distance your explosions travel, skates to increase your character speed, a punching glove to punch bombs three spaces away and over walls, a kick that will send it down an aisle until it hits something, and new to me is the spike bombs whose fire will penetrate and only stop when it hits non-destructible stuff, and water balloon looking bombs which, when kicked, will keep bouncing around, sometimes rather erratically. The campaign can be played with one or two players cooperatively, as they combat an evil emperor that attempts to take control of the universe by raising the dastardly bombers from the scrap pile, and has each of them defend a planet. Each planet you visit has eight stages and two boss levels, before facing the Emperor in a two-level fight at the end. My first time trying the campaign, I finished it on veteran difficulty, which is normal, in just under three hours. There are three difficulties which change your starting lives, and allegedly increases the boss's difficulty. You can continue when all your lives are gone, but you pay differing amounts of gems per continue, depending on the difficulty level. Now your gem stash is also used to purchase cosmetic items, open new characters, and purchase new maps for multiplayer, so the more you have to continue, the more you put yourself out from buying things. When you complete a planet, there's a bit of an odd tally on your reward, including how many pickups you've gotten and your current life count, whether you've continued or not. Which sort of brought about an odd situation, as on Veteran for example, you're given 50 gems for each remaining life. A continue costs 300 gems, which starts you with 7 lives, when you take that versus the 50 times 7, you actually net 50 if you sacrifice your last life before you defeat the boss. Most of the campaign levels involve completely destroying all of the AI enemies, but there are alternate themes on each world to attempt to mix up the action. For example, in the tech world, some stages you have to press all switches before the exit will open. A later planet has you rescuing and leading civilians to the exit before being able to continue. The first boss fight of each world is you taking them on in their smaller robot form, and the second is a giant machine form. I personally found the one-on-ones to be very frustrating and unnecessarily difficult, as they perfectly dodge, even to a seemingly glitching perspective, the entire grid of bombs you may lay down. Unfortunately, I often found the best method to be kamikaze. During the machine fight, you're free to move around diagonally on a gridless platform, which feels a bit awkward for Bomberman, but these phases were a little bit more involved, dodging the boss's telegraphed moves. I found the biggest issues of the campaign to be the awkward selection of a camera angle. Now, I've missed a few of the recent Bomberman outings, last playing, like I said, in the Nintendo 64 days, but the overhead view of the grid made things very manageable. For some reason, the developers found it necessary to spin around 40 degrees and bring your point of view down about halfway to a nearly isometric view. I'm not sure if this was to show off some graphics and textures more plainly, but not being able to control the camera angle, scrolling the stage to get to the next area can often lead to cheap deaths, as it doesn't keep your character centered. I particularly found this odd because in multiplayer we'll return to the simple overhead view, which just makes things more manageable. Controlling Bomberman in an age where every touch of the control pad doesn't just move him a half square, I found managing the speed power-ups a challenging task in the campaign. I used to be able to just easily lay a bomb on every other square of the grid, creating powerful explosions that would weave throughout the entire stage. But in this game I often failed miserably with that camera angle and lack of movement precision. I've only dabbled a little with the multiplayer so far, and I noticed an update hit the other day to help reduce input lag and some other funkiness that was occurring in the online matches. I only have a Pro Controller and the two Joy-Cons that came with the Switch so far, so I'm not really sure if I could even manage the local player right now, because it looks like the settings are for 4 and 8 player only? I don't know, the diagrams make it look like it's pretty easy to have Switches all hook up locally, if you know people that have them. I did see that Jiro still got it. And upon winning in League Play, it looks like they're rankings to move yourself up in the Bomberman world if you so desire. One interesting addition that, again, could have been the previous games that I just haven't seen is these revenge carts. When you die in a match, you're allowed to go around the outside wall and toss in weak bombs to try and eliminate whoever killed you, or just wreak all the havoc you desire. If you kill them, you get swapped in to continue the match until all players are gone. Definitely can make the matches a little bit longer, but it was kind of a fun twist. Also, the floors were disappearing on the map I was playing on, forcing you to be a little more careful about where you lay your bombs. 
Bomberman has always been what I call very Japanese, both in its sense of humor and just kind of its general aesthetic. The game's soundtrack is very like, arcade pop, I guess I'd call it, that you either like or you don't. With a three hour campaign that feels pretty repetitive immediately, if you're not interested in $50 worth of online or local multiplayer out of the gate, you may want to hold off on the purchase. The campaign replay value does come in by being the only way to access new content, but I think that currency system was a bit frustrating, and once through the campaign was enough for me. The online multiplayer seemed pretty stable and could be engaging for those that have the competitive edge, but for me, without giving evil glares to that person that just killed you, I lose a little bit of desire. Personally, I'm wondering if we haven't moved past the era of Bomberman, or maybe the developers Konami and Hexadrive have just run out of ideas for the series over the last 33 years. So to sum it up, the game looks clean enough. It was developed on the Unity engine, which seems a bit odd to me for AAA developers personally, but I'm not looking for a Unity argument. The controls don't feel very accurate, especially when piling on necessary speed. The campaign story is skippable. It's fairly short and has a weird currency system. The game has seemingly stable online play with leagues, but doesn't offer a whole lot of match customization, and there's just not a whole lot added to the dozen or so game legacy Bomberman has brought us. Rated as an action combat game, Super Bomberman R hits a 42 out of 100, with 50 being an average game. This is Jiro for Umber Games. Thanks for watching. Here for all things new and nostalgic, hit subscribe for more videos or follow me on Twitter at Umber Games.